We're in part seven of an eight-part series in one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, Romans 8, entitled God is for you. And we've seen in every week different ways that God is for us. Oftentimes, we humans find ourselves in situations where we wonder, how could anything good come out of this mess? Situations that might be frightening, confusing, painful, or unfair. And today we're going to examine one of the most precious promises in the entire Bible. There are a lot of great promises in the Bible that we need to learn and we need to claim and we need to stand on and believe. This is one of them. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This, as I mentioned, is one of the best known verses in the Bible. Many Christians down through the ages have found this to be a promise that's like a pillow to rest their weary heads on. Maybe some of you memorize this if you grew up in the church. When I was a kid, we memorized a few verses here and there, and this was one of them from the old King James, all things work together for good. And uh, someone wrote this, and I thought it was interesting. If the entire Bible was a necklace, then Romans would be the pendant on that necklace. Romans 8 would be the cluster of diamonds in the middle of that pendant. And verse 28 would be the brightest diamond in the cluster. Now, notice this verse begins with a conjunction and. It's very connected to what we studied last week. Last week, we studied that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is a divine being who you can know, who wants to have a relationship with us as followers of Jesus. And he is described in many ways uh, as, as someone who encourages, a counselor, a teacher, a comforter, a guide, a friend, a helper, one who is with you and in you if you're a follower of Jesus. And when we don't know how to pray, as we saw last week, sometimes we just don't know what to pray. And, he, and the Holy Spirit helps us. If you're suffering, if you're in some kind of agony of the soul, and, and it maybe all you can do is just utter a deep sigh, well, guess what? The Holy Spirit interprets that and turns it into a prayer, which God understands. That's beautiful. We saw that last week. And so now, uh, as, we're, as we're looking at the fact that God is for you, that he's on your side, that he loves you, that he has a divine plan for you, Romans 8, 28 connects to, to those verses and says, and here's something else for you to know. Not only does the Holy Spirit direct your life, he directs it according to God's purposes, as we're going to see in the next verses. Now notice here, the, the text begins with the saying, this is something we no, we know. What do we know? That's what we're going to focus on today. Because there, let's be honest, there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> In the context right here, the earlier verses says sometimes we don't know how to pray. There's an example. Or we don't know why we suffer. We don't know why unfair things happen to good people. There's so much we don't know. I remember one day, uh, <laughs> my son was in high school, and he was telling me about this kid at school, and he said, Daddy's so annoying. I said, well, what makes him annoying? He says, well, he always wants to debate politic and religions, but dad, he's all messed up on the facts. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's true a lot of times. A lot of people are messed up on the facts. In fact, I don't know how you feel, but I feel very frustrated about the fact that today, it is hard to know what the facts are many times about a situation. There's so much false information in this world and conflicting reports. For example, uh, one of the things many of us are doing right now is praying for peace in the Holy Land. We're praying. It's, it's heavy on our heart what's happening with this conflict, right? But last week, there's this news report that says Israel bombed a Palestinian hospital and killed like 500 plus people. And there was riots in all the countries around there and people were marching on embassies and set a couple embassies on fire and then another report comes out and said, no, that's not what happened at all. The missile was coming the other way. It was coming from a terrace, and it failed, and it went into the parking lot. It didn't even hit the hospital. And we're like, I still don't know what the truth is, what's really going on. Sometimes it is hard to find 
the facts. Today, we are not going to talk about what we don't know. We're going to talk about something we know. Not interpretations, not private views, not opinions, not guesses. Something we know. It's foolish to claim that we know what we don't know. But it's also foolish to claim that we don't know what we do know. So let's be sure that we know. And when we know certain things from God's word, it not only informs our our thinking, it inspires our hope and it builds our faith. And I hope that that's what this verse does for you. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Okay, here's what I want to do with this verse. I want to break it down and talk to you about five truths that we know. Number one, the text says God works. He's at work in our lives. Now, we live, we live in an age of reason and enlightenment where oftentimes secular humanism prevails. It's easy for us, even as believers, to be influenced by the philosophies around us. And those of us who, who tend to be more scientifically minded or more rationally uh, minded, uh, we're especially in danger, if we're not careful, of sort of subtly adopting a, a more deistic philosophy of life. What does that mean? The dictionary defines deism this way. The belief based solely on reason in a God who created the universe and then abandoned it, assuming no control over life, exercising no influence on natural phenomena, and giving no supernatural revelation. A deist would say, yeah, I believe in God. He was the first cause of this universe, but he's not involved now in the day-to-day lives. He set up universal laws, and then he checked out. He's kind of like this divine watchmaker who made the watch, wound it up, and then walked off for other, to other projects and just let it tick and ignored it. He does not intervene. He, he's like an absentee landlord. Now, those of us who have read and believed the scriptures know that that is not the case that God is involved, that he does care. And we know that not only from reading the scriptures, but many of us from our own personal experience. So from our text today, we know first that God works. Second, we know that God works for good. He's not out to get you. He's not waiting for you to trip so he can pounce on you. He's not like an officer who's hiding with his radar gun trying to catch you driving too fast. (laughs) God is for you. He loves you. He's working in your life for good. Now, sometimes you don't see it. You don't see the good that God will eventually bring out of a situation that you're experiencing. Maybe you're in it right now, and you don't see it. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a long time to realize it. And often you don't see it until you're looking backwards, and you're saying, oh, I see now. I see now what God was doing. It wasn't clear then, but I can see it looking back. So often when we're in the middle of affliction, there's no clarity. And sometimes we don't understand how God worked for good until he eventually explains, as I believe he will, in heaven. Sometimes you have to wait till then to really understand. If we really believe that God is working for our good, it will enable us to look all the time for his activity in our circumstances to be aware, to be looking. An example of this, I think a great example, is the Apostle Paul. We've been studying Romans 8, which he wrote to the church in Rome before he ever went to Rome, but he ended up eventually in prison in Rome because of his faith. And he wrote a couple of his New Testament letters, such as Philippians and a couple others, from prison. Now, ending up in prison for his faith was a negative thing wouldn't you say who wants to be in prison and he could have developed a bad attitude and and then been like why me what's the matter with you god i did all this for you and now look what you're doing for me why would you let this happen it really paid off for me to put you first in my life look where it took me and he could have got into a bitterness into a pity party and yet he did not instead he looked around And he found evidence of God working even in the midst of an unjust captivity. And he said this in Philippians chapter 1. He said, 
I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. What a beautiful example of choosing to look for evidence of God working for good, even in the midst of a bleak situation. Paul says, hey, you wouldn't believe it. This has enabled all the palace guard to hear about Jesus, and it's given encouragement to others outside the prison who are experiencing persecution so that they'll keep loyal to their faith and keep sharing their faith. Beautiful example. Romans 8, 28 assures us, number three, God works for good in all things. Some, not just some things, but all things. Nothing is outside of God's realm, God's ability, or God's notice. Regardless of what comes our way, there is nothing that he can't overrule, override, turn a different direction. Nothing is outside the scope of his providence. Have any of you ever done a, a needlepoint project? Anybody ever done one of those? Yeah, a few of you have. My wife's done some of those. In fact, we have one in our living room that's the ABCs that she did, and they're very elaborate. It's really a nice piece of art. And I, I don't know why it's the ABCs. If you need to go brush up, I guess. You can go over there and <laughs> check in on it. But, but it, is really, it is really a pretty piece of art, unless you turn it upside down. If you would take it out of the frame, it's all framed now, but if you take it out and you look at the back of it, it's just a mass of tangled threads. Not pretty at all. There's crossovers and knotted ends and loose ends woven through. It really makes a difference which side you're looking at. Most of the time in life, this life, we only see little pieces of the back side of the whole thing. We, we could not see the full picture yet. And so we're confused. Life doesn't make sense. It's hard for us to believe that God is working for our good in all things. But when we see the whole thing on the right side, it will take on a whole new, deeper meaning. For now, we've got to ask God to grow our faith so that the tangled patterns of life are seen as just pieces that God is using to somehow work toward a divine plan for his children God works for good in all things. Now, sometimes people have misquoted this verse, Romans 8, 28, especially relying, I think, on the old language of the King James Version. They sort of shrug their shoulders and have this attitude of fatalism and say, well, all things work out for good. All things work together for good, as though everything's always going to be good in the long run in this life, which is not the case. It's not true. Some, from a human perspective, some things appear to turn out terrible. I mean, think about martyrs historically and even today who prayed to God for deliverance, but they burned at a stake. That was not a good thing. <laughs> but even though things didn't work out the way they prayed or the way they hoped, God can still bring out good from all things. In fact, there are many people historically who have become Christians by watching the faith of martyrs. And God used that and redeemed it into something good. In fact, the early church spread quickly as a result of persecution. Nobody wants persecution, but it impacted the church positively, it spread the church out and it spread the faith deep. And in fact, it's been said often that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. See, God works for good in all things, in all things. But there is a limitation. Here's a fourth truth we know. God works for good in all things for those who love him. You, you see, we can't just quote all things work together for good without adding for those who love him. It's a necessary limitation. There's other examples we could give in scripture. For example, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Romans 1.16, where Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto, for everyone. It, he says it's the power of God for salvation for everyone. But it doesn't stop there. 
If you stop there, it's not a universal truth because not everyone will be saved. That's universalism. That's not biblical. But the verse doesn't stop there. It adds the words, who believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. You see, there's a necessary limitation. And that's how it is here in Romans 8, 28. God's children are the ones who love him, those who are followers of Jesus. And it's for them that God is working all things together for good. Now, most of the time, the scripture emphasizes God's love for us more than our love for him. For example, 1 John 4.10 says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Or 1 John 4.19, We love because he first loved us. You see, our love for him is always a response to his love for us. It's not something that we generate by just trying harder to say, I will love God, I will love God. It's more like as we focus on what he's done for us, particularly through his son at the cross, we react to that grace initiative, that love that's been demonstrated for us at the cross, and we react by loving him back. And on our own, we can't love God. We, all the prayers and songs and recited creeds and rigorous rituals in the world won't enable us to muster up love. But when we, when we focus on Jesus and the gospel, there is this response to God's grace initiative that wells up. God's redeemed children love him. And for them, he works for good in all things. Now, here's a fifth truth from this verse, <clears throat> God works for good in all things for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And these two qualifiers go hand in hand. Those who love him are also those who are called according to his purpose. And I think the next two verses further explain what it means to be called according to his purpose. Verse 29 and 30. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Now, this word predestined or predestination occurs a few times in the writings of Paul, and it has caused a whole lot of discussion and, in fact, arguments throughout Christian history. In fact, whole denominations have divided or formed around how to answer this question. And sometimes people end up going to extremes on one side or the other. Some theological traditions emphasizing the sovereignty of God go so far as to say God pre-selects every person who will be saved or lost. And he says, you know, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell. You're going to heaven, you're going to hell. And there's nothing you can do about it. And that's an extreme view, but it's out there. And then on the other hand, there are some traditions that emphasize the free will of humans. And some go to an extreme and act like it's mostly up to human choice if you're saved or lost. And even insisting that you can fall in and out of your salvation over and over again. So we've got these extremes, neither of them healthy. Usually in, in most situations, the, the truth is in a balance is in a, that has to be held in tension. And such is the case here. I think that in order to be biblical, we have to come to a view that counts for both God's sovereignty and, God's, and, and humans' free will. Both. I like the way Stuart Briscoe says it in this quote. <clears throat> Whatever conclusion we may reach in this matter, it should be obvious that nothing in the foreknowing of God can deny the necessity of human responsibility. And nothing that man can do will ever detract from the omnipotence of God. See, we hold these, these two things in tension. They're both true. God is sovereign and in control, but humans have responsibility as well. And so um, God knows the future, but he doesn't always force it. He allows for there to be human um, decisions because he has given us free will. I don't believe the idea of predestination is meant to teach that God chooses some but not others. 
I know there are verses that, that people use to try to make the Bible say that, but there are many verses that talk about how God wants as many as possible. He wants all who will to come to faith. And everything we have is from him. From beginning to end, he gets all the credit. It's, salvation is all his initiative. It's all his solution. It's all his work. He planned for our salvation. He made provision for it, and he will carry it through to completion. He won't force it on you, but he gets all the credit. Now, <clears throat> notice again in this verse, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Notice this. This is his goal for all, all of his followers. Be conformed to the image of his son. His goal for us is that there is a transformation happening in us over time. It's called sanctification. It's a process where he is conforming us more and more to the original pattern. Originally, humans were made in the image of God, and we still are reflectors of his image. But because of sin, that image has been marred or distorted over time. And it is his purpose to restore that image in us, to conform us to the likeness of his son. So sometimes God uses the circumstances in our life to form us, to shape us. He has a plan for us, and we don't always understand it, let alone welcome his plan. But um, Romans 8.28 does not say that God works in all things for our comfort and ease. That's not his primary goal for us in this life. But he always is out for our best interest. Have you ever put together a big jigsaw puzzle? Anybody done that? Some of you have done that? Um, I'm not too into that, but you know, during COVID, my wife and I put together a few puzzles and played some games, did things we don't usually do. We were stuck, you know, and trying to figure it out. Um, <clears throat> I saw one advertised this week. I don't know why anybody would want this. Thousand pieces, and the title of it is 101 Pooping Dogs. And you look at the picture, and that's 101 poop. I mean, who would want to spend time looking at that? But uh, apparently, somebody would. So um, sometimes people really get into this and enjoy it and dedicate it, you know, a part of their dining room table or put up a card table and, and just work on it over time. Or Some of it can be really tough, you know, especially if it's all the same kind of same colors and you have to find the edges first and you try to figure it out. One thing you don't do, you never pour all the pieces out on the table and then throw the box away. Why? Because you need that picture to follow, right? You need to prop that up. You need an image that you want to conform to. Uh, speaking of COVID, 2020 was not a good year. Are you aware of that? There was a lot of problems we all encountered. Our, our church was closed for six months. Oh, it's terrible. We did some outdoor services during the summer, but um, finally we got reopened and we were trying to follow all the protocols and it was, it was a challenge. And uh, Christmas rolled around and a lot of churches canceled their normal Christmas services because we we're still trying to, you know, get through this. And we talked about it and we said, you know, I don't think so. People want to come out. People want to gather if they don't want to, they can stay home, but I think some of them do. So we ended up putting tables in here and spreading them out six feet, trying to social distance and served hot chocolate and cookies, did a piano bar, we called it. And we, because there was limited seating and you had to reserve it, we did 12 services that year. Whew. And it was just an attempt to reach as many people as possible. And people came, everyone was packed out. And it, it, it was really beautiful, but it was a lot of work for the teams, especially the worship teams. And so with 12 services, I noticed back in the green room, uh, there was all kinds of things happen. One thing, uh, some of them were putting together puzzles, you know, just working on it between the services. And I went back there and I saw this. I saw this picture that uh, Jody Walsh was working on a puzzle. And I said, that's Ralph. That's her husband, Ralph, on a horse. And that's a puzzle. And I didn't know this. Uh, Jody and Ralph back there. I didn't know that you can actually take a picture to this place and they make a puzzle for you. That's pretty cool. But I noticed also that she had the box up just because she loves to look at her husband, I'm sure, or the horse. But, 
but she had the box up so that she could follow the pattern so that the, what, the image that eventually emerged would conform to the pattern. Now, life is like this. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle that is being put together slowly. And sometimes it's, pu- it's puzzling <laughs> because all the pieces aren't assembled yet. And it's messy. It's unfinished. The picture isn't emerging fully. But God has given us a picture to follow, to seek after, to emulate in our lives, and it is the image of his son. That's his purpose, for us to be conformed more and more towards the image of his son. Now go back to our our key verse here, Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. One of my favorite stories that illustrates this in the scriptures, demonstrating how God can overrule bad circumstances to work for good in our lives, is found in the Old Testament story, the first book of the Bible, the Old Testament story of Joseph. It's a beautiful story. If you haven't read it lately, it's the last 12 chapters of Genesis, and it's compelling. God has plans for Joseph's life from the time he's a boy, which is true for all of us. From from the time we're, we're, even in our mother's womb, the Bible says, God has a plan for our lives. And so when he's a teenager, God starts revealing some things to Joseph through dreams. And the problem was Joseph did not seem to have a lot of discernment or discretion at first (laughs) as a young man. Because he told his brothers about some dreams he was having that he probably should have just kept it between him and God. In one dream, they're out binding up these big sheaves of wheat. And he told his brothers how all of their sheaves of wheat bowed down to his. And then he said, I had another dream. And I saw the sun and the moon and 11 stars all bowing down to me. Which he interpreted as his father, his mother, and his brothers all bowing to him. Now he was right about his dreams but he probably shouldn't have talked about him to his brothers. Not a good idea. Made his brothers angry, and the fact that his dad favored him and his little brother over the other brothers didn't help things out either. Parents, please don't favor children over other children. It always has negative impact, and such is the case in this story. Brothers got very jealous to the point where they hated Joseph. Joseph was abused by his brothers. He was sold as a slave. They lied to his father and said he was killed by an animal. He, in captivity in Egypt, worked his way up uh, until he had a great job and he had the favor of a prominent Egyptian. But then he was falsely accused by his wife, ended up in prison. If there was anybody who had a reason to cop a negative attitude, it was Joseph. He was just thrown away, abandoned. Where are you, God? He had every reason to become a bitter person, but the evidence is, instead, he continued to look for God's providence at every step, even in prison, even in years of waiting, uncertainty. Finally, he ends up promoted to serve in Pharaoh's court and then gets promoted to be like the vice president of the nation of Egypt in the time of famine where he had made provision and when his brothers come to buy grain during this famine, they don't recognize him. He recognizes them and he could have arrested them. He could have severely rebuked them at least. But instead, what does he do? This is a companion verse that illustrates very clearly the message of Romans 8.28. It's Genesis 50.20. Joseph says, and they're terrified when they figure out who he is. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for what? Good. To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Even though multiple bad things happened to Joseph, he chose not to focus on those things, but on what God might be doing through it. What are you doing, God? How are you going to work through this? I don't see it yet. But eventually he did see it. And how did he see it? Looking back. (laughs) Not when he was in the middle of the prison. Looking back, he could see how God worked for good in all things that had happened to him. 
That's the perspective of a man who has faith in a loving and gracious Heavenly Father. Remember, friends, God is for you, not against you. He's working for your good. And God's perfect plan might not be clear to you right now. It might be, might be, you might be confused. Someday it will be clear. And we don't know when. It might be a matter of weeks, months, years. It might be in eternity, but eventually the picture will be clear. Have you ever looked into one of those uh, hologram pictures? I don't know what they call them, but it's like, it just looks like it's a bunch of colors and lines at first. But if you stare in it and you don't lose your concentration, all of a sudden it pops. There's something in there. It's like a 3D type picture. You see one of those? Uh, those are fun. To, and sometimes it doesn't work quickly and sometimes it doesn't work at all for me. I'm just looking at it like, where is it? I don't see it. But, but if you stare long enough, sometimes it's sort of like your, your eyes twitch and, and they refocus and suddenly you see deep into the picture there's this hidden hologram. And I think life is like that. Much of the time you just see lines and colors, but occasionally, especially looking back over life, we see a picture that God has been creating. And, and we see that it's a beautiful picture. This we know. In fact, would you look up here with me? And would you read out loud with me with one voice like we believe this? Like we have faith? Okay, here we go. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the good news, the promise that we've focused on today, that you are working for your purposes in our life, even when we can't see it. Give us faith, Lord. Give us faith to believe this is true and strengthen our faith so that it is, it's strong courage, strong hope. We thank you that you are for us. And we want to respond by being for you. And we do so now as we worship you with joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.